Good day and welcome to Letters and Politics. I'm Mitch Jezerich. Today we're going to be in conversation about one of the most controversial world leaders, that being Vladimir Putin. Our guest today has written a biography on the man. Our guest is Philip Short and the biography is called Putin. Philip Short has also written a number of other biographies, including on such figures as Mao Zedong and Pol Pot. He joins me from France. Philip Short, it is a great pleasure to welcome you to this radio program. It's good to be with you. My interest was piqued in your prologue when you quoted yourself Richard Hofstadter. Richard Hofstadter uh, was a 20th century American historian, wrote a lot about paranoia and extreme forms of politics in the United States. He wrote uh, a lot about Barry Goldwater in the middle of the 20th century. And I just want to mm-hmm. quote what you wrote here. You said this, quote, Richard Hofstetter at the height of the Cold War, when he wrote in Harper's Magazine of the American tendency to view every enemy as a perfect model of malice, a kind of amoral superman, sinister, ubiquitous, powerful, cruel, who profits from the misery he has produced. Again, that's what you put in your prologue to your biography on Vladimir Putin. Is that how America sees Putin in your view? I think you tend to see everything in very Manichaean terms, in very black and white terms. And if someone is black, uh, they are utterly black. Um, it, it, I think I say somewhere in the book that, you know, it, it, it from the uh, even the mainstream American press uh, over the last uh, five or six years, we're not just talking about now when you have the war in Ukraine, um, that if you tried to say that, well, actually, Putin is not totally black, he has done s- some things for Russians, which Russians really appreciate, uh, it was a bit like saying, well, maybe Hitler had redeeming features, and it, it would be viewed in that way. Uh, there was, uh, I, I do think, you know, even Mike McCall, who's in precisely your neck of the woods um, uh, over in California, at, uh, at Stanford. Mike McCall is not a friend of Putin at all. I should explain he was uh, under Obama. He was the US ambassador to Moscow. Um, he had a very hard time there. Uh, even he he said, you know, the, the view conveyed by the American press is cartoonized. Now, he was talking four or five years ago, and I'm, I was talking just then four or five years ago. The war in Ukraine has changed a lot. Um, it, you know, Putin has invaded. He sent troops in there, tens of thousands of people dying. Uh, all wars are ghastly. All wars are criminal, uh, one might say, except wars of defense when one is attacked and you have to defend yourself. Um, so uh, we're really into a, a, a different situation now. And it's a different situation in Russia, too, because the crackdown on dissent, the crackdown on anybody who objects to the war has become extremely vicious, extremely tough. Um, but even so, remember, Putin is not, you know, kind of uniformly black. He has done things for Russians, which Russians appreciate. He still has uh quite a high popularity um so for us uh, to 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 view him as all totally negative i think is 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 not helpful and it doesn't help us understand where he's coming from where russians are coming from and why all this is happening you spent eight years writing on this book working on this book yeah, i did I, I mean all biographies take a a huge amount of time and you tell your publisher, well, all right, if you really insist, I can probably do it in three or four years. And the publisher knows you're not telling the truth. <laughs> it's going to take longer because you really have to dig very deep to try and establish what what a personal, the personality of, of a, a major leader is like. It requires reading millions of words of his speeches, his interviews, uh, going back through newspaper paper archives back into the 1980s, hundreds of interviews, and so on and so forth. And let me not make that sound boring. It's great fun. And when you actually find something, you, you, get, you get an insight. You think, wow, that day has not been wasted. So it is interesting, but it's detective work, and it's very slow, and, and uh, you have to be very patient. You interviewed more than 200 people, including people who 
knew Putin personally and and who were even friends with him, even from from his childhood. Yes, and I think always uh, the the most revealing period of a person's life is when they are younger, when they are uh, coming, you know, on, on their ascent to power, uh, when their personality is forming. Um, once they're already in power, uh, it's it's not just kind of more of the same. Putin has had a very interesting career in power, um, but they've made it. And it's how they make it, how they get there. Did they want to get there? In Putin's case, you can really ask that. You know, was he struggling to become president? Um, I think not. He was ambitious uh, and he had this gift of making himself indispensable at, at kind of crucial periods of, of his career. Um, Yeltsin, who was was uh, the president, and before that, the mayor of St. Petersburg, who kind of first brought him into politics, a man called Anatoly Sobchak. Um, they both found that when they were looking for someone to, to do particular things, well, who else is there but Putin? And you can say, well, you know, that's opportunism on his part. He kind of, by accident, he got there, but not really. He He made himself indispensable. So he's not an accidental president, but he's not someone either who really kind of struggled up that greasy pole as, as so many politicians do. You think early on his ambition wasn't necessarily to become president of Russia? No, I, I think that came really very late. I think he was genuinely surprised and to some extent hesitant as to whether this was a job he really wanted to do early on. I mean, if you go right back to his childhood, uh, he was a little tear away in a very tough area of Leningrad in the, the early 1950s, the period shortly after the war. He was born when Stalin was still in power, um, but he, he, he grew up under Stalin's successors. Um, and he was, he was a kid who kind of hung out in the courtyard and the courtyard of his apartment block was filthy. <laughs> you know, there were drunks. Uh, alcoholics passing out, um, uh, loads of kids who fought, formed gangs, fought, fought uh, became street kids. Um, and he could have gone down that road, but he didn't because he became interested in, in sport, in uh, judo and its Russian martial arts equivalent, sambo, which is a kind of, you know, a martial art perfected by the Soviet military. Um, and he became very good at that. And it's a discipline. You know, he once said, uh, you know, when you're, when you're on the judo mat, you bow to each other. There is a ritual. You don't smack the other guy in the face. Um, well, the, the, the world he came from was a, a world of smacking the other guy in the face. And the world he entered was a, a much more ritualized world with its rules and everything else. So that was, in a way, his salvation. Then he decided he wanted to join the KGB. Lots, lots of kids did of, of his age at that time in the Soviet Union because it was a way of getting a kind of privileged position in society, um, of having access to things that other people couldn't do, of having forbidden knowledge that other people couldn't have. And uh, he, he managed, he went to university, he was able to get into university partly because of his sports ability, you know, kind of sports scholarship thing, and joined the KGB. Uh, did not have a particularly wonderful career there. It was a rather ordinary career. But then the Soviet Union fell apart and he, he got into politics. He got into politics very largely through the KGB, which uh, was perplexed in the extreme by this kind of new democratic movement that had come into, into being under Gorbachev and wanted to... I mean, was very suspicious of these so-called Democrats in, in, in uh, the Soviet Union um, and wanted to, uh, to, to, to attach people to them. And so Putin was attached to the up-and-coming uh, liberal politician, Anatoly Sobchak, who became mayor of St. Petersburg. And, and from there, his political career sort of took off. Do you think he starts to uh, COVID the idea of being president from there? Or, or does even... No, no much later. Really much later, Mitch. Um, I, I, he, he obviously 
um, enjoyed uh, and got a lot of satisfaction from being deputy mayor and, and fairly quickly acting mayor whenever Sobchak was away. He became acting mayor of St. Petersburg, which is a city of five million people. It's uh, the second city in Russia. Um, he was extremely good at what he did. He was highly organized. Uh, he knew which but buttons to push. Uh, as a, a New York Times correspondent who went there at the time said that. Um, and lots of other people have said similar things. He was, he could make things happen. He could make the trains run on time for the administration. And it was a time when uh, St. Petersburg, Russia as a whole, was very much the wild, the wild east. Organized crime was absolutely rampant. Uh, you couldn't be in politics without dealing with organized crime. So when people say uh, Putin was into organized crime in, in St. Petersburg in the 1990s, sure he was. Everybody was. It was impossible to do politics without. I mean, you know, think of Chicago going back a century or so. Um, or there's this wonderful book, um, wonderful story about it, it, Tweedsville. Um, oh, Lincoln Steffens about corruption uh, in early 20th century America, the muckrakers. Um, it, it's with, Russia was going through very much that kind of period. Um, I don't think I'm saying moral equivalence. You know, different countries go through different times at, at, at different uh, stages. This is, but this is time. a tough period in, in Russian history, no doubt. It was an extraordinarily tough period because, you know, poverty was, you were either poor or destitute or you were making millions out of the misery of others. And 99% were poor or destitute. It was very, very tough. Uh, th these are the Yeltsin years. Um, and there's, there's a very big question as to whether the West generally, not ju just the United States, should not have been more magnanimous having won the Cold War, whether we should not really have helped Russia stand on its feet more. Certainly Russians you know, really resented the fact that we, we said, look, our system is best. You've got to do this. You've got to privatize. And it's going to be very tough for you because uh, living standards are going to go through the floor. But in the end, it'll work out. And the, the you know, democracy, which initially people thought, great, we're going to have all these freedoms that people have in the West. They then made a pun in Russian. Um, it's not democracy. It's democracy. It's shitocracy. Uh, there was a, a real disillusionment with what had been held out to them as a bright, glowing future, and they felt cheated. That's the beginning, if you like, of, of the kind of resentments that built up, uh, have built up over the last 20 years uh, in, in Russia and have culminated in, in the situation we have today. Because of arcane radio rules and broadcasting rules in America. I'll have to edit out that word, but I think it was an important word. So we'll just say excrement democracy is, is, is <laughs> excremental. <the> maybe. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I, I'm sorry about that. No, um, no, no, no. It's it. I'm sorry. I'm sorry that we have, you, you could say these words on the internet, on cable news, but f heaven forbid, if they were said on terrestrial radio, the moral fabric of, of society would be in jeopardy. Um, but, but those are the rules. Uh, <laughs> um, it, I mean, th this period in the 90s, is, I think, I, I suspect, is, is very important to understand. And I, I recognize it's a complex relationship that Russia and Putin has to ideas of liberalism. But sort of now when we see more of a rejection towards liberalism, it's important to understand this history, isn't it? I think it is important. I think we, we actually need to go back even even a little bit further. Um, the disillusionment of the 90s was was something which became very widespread. Um, not everybody, you know, intellectuals who found finally they could say what they wanted to say. They still look back on the 90s as a, as a kind of wonderful period. But for, for most people, it was very, very tough. And there was a, a great deal of resentment against the West for, you know, I mean, we gave much more aid to Poland with uh, a, a vastly a quarter of the population that Russia has, less than a quarter, than we gave to, to the Soviet Union, the ex-Soviet Union, to, to Russia. 
Um, so there was that. But if you go back still further, there's, there's, there's another kind of conflict which has gradually emerged. Putin um, was brought up in a, a Soviet tradition. Uh, all the people of his generation were, where uh, the West was portrayed as the main adversary. Um, Russia was being surrounded by you know, hostile pro-Western or Western states. And um, the West had you know, nothing, nothing good uh, in its feelings towards Russia. And that goes right back. It's not just Soviet. It goes back much further into, into the empire, the Russian empire, where there was this, this feeling it's called the, the belief of what, who are called the, the, the Slavophiles, those who thought that Russia should follow its own path, uh, that, that Russia was kind of a, um, an anointed country, an exceptional country, uh, that the West was individualistic, Europe was individualistic and, and um, uh, decadent. And th there's, there's all that kind of root which says Russia should not cozy up to the West. And the other side of Putin was he was born and grew up in St. Petersburg, which is the window onto the west of Russia. Um, he, uh, when he was in the 1990s, he was really quite genuinely liberal and pro-Western. And that continued through his, his first years in power. So he's always had these two sides, one of them re resisting and suspecting the West's intentions, the other saying Russia's future is with the West. Uh, he said often enough in the early days when he was in power, that Russia is part of Europe culturally uh, and in every other way. Our place is part of the civilized world, in inverted commas, meaning the world uh, uh, in which the West plays the major role. Um, and these two, these two views have kind of pulled against each other. To start with, it was the pro-Western view, which was very much dominant. And gradually, over the last 20 years, he's moved away from that towards the, the older uh, kind of ancestral, deeply rooted view that Russia should never trust the West. The West really wants Russia's downfall. There's an age-old hostility there. And that is what has become dominant, particularly over the last five to ten years. Putin wants to end United States dominance in Europe, doesn't he? He does. And that's what, that fundamentally is what the war in Ukraine is about. It's, it's an attempt to show, it's not, it's not so much about Ukraine, although he does feel he's had this kind of fixation on Ukraine for a long, long time. Back in the 1990s, I mean, so much goes back to that, that period of time. But back in the 1990s, he said um, that, talking particularly about Crimea, that, you know, we won Crimea from the Turks. You talk about the 18th century when uh, Russia won it from the Ottoman Empire. And the idea that Crimea should be part of Ukraine rather than part of Russia, he, he's always found to be absolutely outrageous. So there is a long fixation there. But um, the, the, the war now is not really so much about Ukraine. It's more about trying to bring Ukraine to heel, but above all, showing that the United States can't stop it. And that would be a way uh, for Putin to say, you know, this is, this is an area where Russian interests have to be taken into account. You can't just ride roughshod over us. And if we have to wage war and have thousands or tens of thousands of people die, uh, to, to, to show it, well, so be it. And he would argue that's how things have happened since the beginning of time. When countries have felt themselves threatened or surrounded, they've fought and the result has been war. Why do you think suddenly we've become so civilized, so, uh, so, so wonderfully cultured that that history of thousands of years of war is just going to end? It won't happen anymore. He has a deep interest in history. He's, it's one of the things that fascinates him. Yes, I, if you ask what Putin does in his spare time, not that he has very much, um, he reads history. Um, he reads philosophy, the Slavophile philosophers. I, I, I mentioned this, this trend of Russian thought that holds that Russia is an exceptional state. Um, 
No, he's he is interested. Uh, he doesn't really have very much else in the way of hobbies. Um, he he's much, you know. John McCain said, "Oh, this guy's a thug," <laughs> and it's kind of one of those, you know, words to encapsulate someone. He's a thug. Well, he's not. He's um, he's cruel. He's ruthless. Uh, he can be vicious. He can be, uh, you know, he is very much becoming no longer just an autocrat but a dictator. Um, and he's ordered people to be assassinated. Um, don't don't think for a moment I'm saying you know this is a nice guy who'd love you'd love to have have have, have dinner with. Um, but he's bright. He he is an intellectual in that sense. He is interested in ideas, he's interested in history, and he has a very agile mind. Um, you know, he does these, these phone-ins uh, every year um, and he has a press conference with the, the, the world's press. They are relatively free. Certainly the press conference, people can ask whatever they like and he has to deal with it and he has no trouble with that. Um, he's not somebody who, um, you know, can't, can't answer questions for four hours. <laughs> he does. Um, and uh, I've talked to a number of diplomats and, and heads of government who've, who've had to deal with him. And they say his, his command of a brief is extraordinarily good. Uh, he amazed um, uh, Clinton's people, Madeleine Albright in particular, and also um, uh, the, the, the British, um, this is in the early 2000s, Tony Blair, when he was prime minister, never using what you call cheat cards you know, he, he would have a two-hour meeting without a single note and would not forget anything that he wanted to raise. That's very, very uncommon in, uh, in politicians, even of world caliber. You call Russia and the United States to be antinomes. What, mm -hmm. what does that mean? And what do you mean by that? Um... You know, I'm going to use. I'm going to introduce an, another word, which probably will delight some of your uh, audience. I'm going to say enantiomorphs. If you can have antinomes, why not enantiomorphs? Mirror images, in other words, that these are other extremes. Um, uh, antinomes, in in the sense that they are, um, they resemble each other, and yet they are extreme in their difference. Um, and uh, I th I think. We talked ju just then about Russia thinking of itself as having an exceptional path. Well, American exceptionalism. And um, one of the problems, I, I think maybe fundamentally one of the core problems of this relationship is that both the United States and Russia think of themselves as exceptional countries uh, who who have um, whose paths are uh, complete unto themselves. And, and yet uh, totally different. Now, how, if you think you're exceptional, it's very difficult to treat other countries as, you know, as equals. And that applies both to Russia and to America. So the relationship is, um, is difficult from the get-go. This is Letters in Politics, and we are in conversation with Philip Short. Philip Short is the author of a new biography on Vladimir Putin. It's called Putin. Philip Short, I want to go back to the beginning. Tell me about the family that Putin comes from. Your description earlier about where he comes from growing up certainly sounds as though he does not come from a politically connected family. His, I, I suspect his rise in the ranks in the political world was his own doing. Yes, that, that is true. Um, there is a little nuance. His grandfather, Spiridon, uh, was uh, a cook. Um, I mean, he came from a village in the provinces and he went to to what was then already the, St. Petersburg for the first time before the re revolution. It hadn't yet become Leningrad. And he um, he started cooking. He cooked among uh, uh, at the Astoria Hotel. Among his clients was a certain Grigory Rasputin, um, the, the Siberian monk who proved the, the, the undoing of, uh, of the Tsar and the Tsarina. Um, he then continued, he, he, he continued to be a cook after, after the revolution. 
and eventually was attached to the family of, uh, of, of Lenin. Um, uh, not to Lenin himself, but to Lenin's uh, widow, Krupskaya, and his sister. Um, and to cook for Lenin, Lenin's family, you had to have extremely high security clearance. Putin said later, oh, he cooked for Stalin. No, he didn't cook for Stalin. That was just kind of gilding the lily. But he did have that connection. His father was a, a, a war veteran. Spiridon's son, Putin's father, was a war veteran. He was um, uh, in the siege of Leningrad. He was wounded. Um, and uh, he then went on to become a, a member of a party committee in a factory. So also, you know, he had kind of good working class credentials. His mother was was very much a homebody. Um, and Putin was born when they were both elderly. They'd lost two children early on, uh, one in the, the siege of Leningrad. And Putin was born when they were both 40. Um, so uh, his mother was nearly 41 when, when he was born. So she was, you know, he was kind of the child, child of their old age. and was cosseted and unspoiled and given a lot of freedom, um, which he abused terribly as a, as a small child. Um, but it wasn't, it wasn't a family that had kind of good connections at any kind of high level, in any high level politics. Where it helped him was that he was of so sound proletarian origins, you know, and the, the family had absolutely, it, it, the Soviet Union was extremely anti-Semitic. He had he had no Jewish connections, uh, which would have made it had he had would have made it impossible for him to get into the KGB. Um, he had uh, the kind of background that uh, those who who had to make decisions about who who should join the security services would 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 find to be a, a good background. How how does he look back on? Speaking of history again, on historical figures like Lenin, the Bolsheviks, perhaps even Marx. He came to have and has now a very negative view of Lenin. Um, and the reason is, it's relevant to what we're seeing in Ukraine now. Uh, the, 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 the early Bolsheviks, in Putin's view, um, by creating a, a federal state in which each part of the Soviet Union, including Ukraine, including Georgia, including um, all the other parts, had had the right of secession. It was a purely theoretical right, but uh, it was not made as a unitary state. You know, the Russian Empire had been a unitary empire. When the Bolsheviks came to power, uh, they, they created this federal state. And Putin has always described that as a time bomb, which they planted under the Soviet Union when it was formed. So Lenin, he he, he has little time for. Uh, the Bolsheviks, I mean, the whole Soviet period, he regards as kind of, you know, an unfortunate interlude where Russia took the wrong path. You can't write it off completely, he says, because a lot of people who are still alive really believed in that. Uh, <laughs> they believed in 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 communism, in Marxism, Leninism. You can't say to people, well, look, <laughs> You were completely wrong all your life. Your your lives are wasted. So uh, he doesn't he doesn't dismiss that period, but it's um, it's not something he dwells on. Uh, Stalin, for the same sorts of reasons, he doesn't condemn. He has condemned Stalin, but he does it less and less because it's part of Russian history. It can't be undone. You have to accommodate it in some way. Now, of course, this is something which many liberal intellectuals in Russia find absolutely abhorrent. They would like a much, much stronger um, condemnation of all the ghastliness that the Bolsheviks did. But Putin's view has always, I mean, he's, he's very much geared to stability, um, to finding uh, arrangements where everybody can 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 feel, I won't say it at ease, but can 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 come to terms with what has happened in the past. So uh, he he goes gently on Stalin. Um, 
other other leaders. Brezhnev, I, I, this is probably someone whom most Americans don't don't instantly say, oh, Leonid, Leonid Brezhnev, him. But Brezhnev, who was the Soviet leader from 1964, uh, uh, up till um, uh, the, the, uh, around 1980, he was in power for 18 years, um, 82. Uh, he also um, very much emphasized the importance of stability. And people speak of his period in time in power as a time of stagnation, which it was. There are, we're beginning to see parallels with Putin's rule now. And Brezhnev's time of stagnation, because Putin wants wants things to go on relatively smoothly. The war in Ukraine, obviously, is an exception, um, and uh, he he's very unwilling to make deep structural reforms, which might kind of make the whole edifice shake. So there are parallels with with Brezhnev. Um, and people are beginning, people in Russia are beginning to say that more and more openly. Here in the United States, we frequently hear that Putin is trying to restore the Soviet empire, but it sounds kind of the opposite of that, what you just said. Would it be more accurate, wanting to restore the Russian empire under the czarist regime, or is that even an inadequate comparison? I think it, you know, in an ideal world, yes. I mean, he has said, as you know, uh, that he said quite early on that it, the collapse of the Soviet Union was the greatest geopolitical tragedy of the 20th century, uh, which was a rather silly thing to say, because clearly there have been far, far more horrible things, the Second World War among them. But um, he's also said that anyone, anyone in Russia who doesn't regret the passing of the Soviet Union has no heart, but anyone who wants to bring it back has no head. Um, okay, it would be lovely if it were possible, Putin says, but it's clearly not possible. So no, I think I think the argument that he's trying to to you know to restore the Soviet Union is wrong. Um, even restore the Russian Empire, yeah, he'd love to do it, but he also knows it's not possible. Um, these are rather simplistic, kind of broad brush interpretations. His his focus is is narrower. It's on pushing back what he sees as uh, American advance up to an American domination up to Russia's borders, and saying, "You Americans, thus far and no further," and that's why I'm fighting in Ukraine. I'd like to return back to sort of his pro liberal anti-liberal tensions within within himself and, and perhaps within mm. russia you say a book about the life of putin is also a book uh, about russia um yeah. is 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 over the last 20 years do we see putin grow more and more conservative yes i think you have and you know, the great question or, or one of the great questions is why this has happened. Did it have to happen? Um, and I think, uh, quite honestly, that uh, the neocons, that Cheney and Wolfowitz and those who thought like them early in the 2000s um, did play a very significant part in this. Uh, and George W. Bush himself. I mean, George W. Bush had a good relationship with Putin right through his two terms. It it's it soured. It became more difficult over time as they disagreed about more and more things. But um, the, the 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 neocon doctrine of trying to um, uh, promote democracy throughout the world, of regime change where it was in America's interests, um, of allowing no constraints on American power. And I'm thinking there of um, America leaving the anti-ballistic missile treaty um, very, very early on in Putin's uh, presidency. Uh, the anti-ballistic missile treaty being one of the kind of foundation stones of, of the whole nuclear disarmament uh, treaty structures. Um, and they left because they thought it was, you know, it was a constraint on what America itself might be able to do um, to enhance its its own nuclear defenses. Um, 
th there was an awful lot that went on that was very difficult for the Russians to accept. And I, I have uh, had an interview with um, a guy, uh, Francis Richards, Sir Francis Richards, who was head of GCHQ, which is our equivalent of the National Security Agency, you know, eavesdrops on everything, and was also an undersecretary at the Foreign Office. And he said, the early 2000s, I went round and talked to people in Washington and talked to people in my own government saying, look, the Russians are being extremely helpful over uh, everything that happened after 9-11, you know, giving us overflight rights, um, uh, making, helping to make bases available in Central Asia. They're, they're doing an awful lot for us and we're not giving anything in return. We need to learn to give as well as take. And he said, you know, the Russians felt fobbed off. And in his words, they were. So I think there were missteps in that early period, which caused, which rankled, which caused the, you know, added to the resentments that were already there from the 1990s. And that certainly was one element, a very important element in making Putin think that he could not rely on the West, he couldn't trust the West, that whatever he did, the West was going to go its own way and pursue its own interests, and Russia's interests would be ignored. Now, you you know, you talk to senior Western officials and they say, oh, that's complete paranoia, that's rubbish. Um, I think sometimes we need to look in the mirror a bit more closely to see what we did. Um, that's not justifying anything on the Russian side. It might have happened anyway, because as I said to you, there is this kind of core um, conflict between a Russian exceptionalism and an American exceptionalism. And it's very difficult to see how those can coexist. But even, you know, Bill Burns, who's now the CIA chief and who was, I, I would argue, probably the best U.S. ambassador to Russia that you've ever had. He wrote uh, in his memoirs that it was, there was the, the, both sides were suffering from delusions. The Russians thought that they would be accepted as members, full members um, alongside America of the world community after the collapse of the Soviet Union. And the Americans thought that Russia would, you know, just kind of meekly follow in the path that America set. So conflict was built into the equation from the very outset. That, that was Bill Burns's phrase. I think he was right. Mm. Um, now, would... Would, would everything that's happened since have happened where had we acted otherwise? Maybe, maybe not. That's speculative and we can have no, no, no way of knowing. It, it certainly seems to me in the last 12, 15 years, there's been an escalation between Russia and the United States. Everybody will remember the claims of Russia interference in the 2016 election. But of course, before that, Putin accused the United States of interference in Russia with protests that were erupting. And it just, you know, it, it just seems all the way up to now what's happening in Ukraine. It, it just seems like there's a, it's not just Ukraine now. It's just not 2016. It seems to me, but I want to know what you think, that there's been an escalation that's been going on here at least 12, 15 years, maybe more. I think more. I think it's been going on very slowly ever since, and with a few steps forward and a few steps back, ever since the collapse of the Soviet Union. It's really, I call it, like, there was a kind of tragic inevitability about it. It's been incremental. Uh, everyone could sort of see that if it went on, there might be a train wreck at the end, but they all basically thought, no, we can avoid that. Um, and so the stars were aligned. There's a kind of Shakespearean quality to this. You know, one of these tragedies that, that everybody can see is building up and it happens and no one can do anything about it. Um, so yes, it's it's been a very gradual process um, and lots of different things have, have applied. May I just pick you up on, on this business of interfering in the 2016 elections? Please. Because, I mean, I was very struck as a European how few American newspapers actually said, well, hey, wait a minute, that's something we've been doing for ages ourselves. 
um, which of course is true. But uh, wh when you say that, um, people say, oh, that's whataboutism, you know, moral equivalence. Uh, there, were, there was a, a guy, I, I think John Spicer, who, who uh, John Seifer, who, who writes on intelligence affairs, who says, who actually said, when America does this kind of thing, it's with the best of intentions because we are fundamentally on the side of democracy. When Russia does it, it's evil. Um, it's a, a difficult argument to accept. And on the business of whataboutism, I think it's fair if you if you accuse. A, a murderer uh, of saying, you know, you say to him, why are you killing all these people? And he says, oh, but there are lots of other people who, 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 who kill people too. It's not just me. That is whataboutism. It is false moral equivalent. But if you accuse somebody of doing what you yourself have done and uh, you pretend, you know, you have the moral high ground, you don't really wish to think about having done such terrible things yourself, you're just accusing them. That's not what about what about is him. You have lost credibility. You've lost uh, um, part of the force of your accusation because actually you did do this kind of stuff yourself. So what about is him I don't buy? <laughs> do you think what happened in the fallout of that 2016 election worsened the dynamic between Russia and the United States? I think the whole Trump period did not help at all because um, Trump was unpredictable. Uh, he had an administration which was to some extent at odds with his own views as far as Russia was concerned. And what I think many, many people don't recognize Trump and Putin, when they had one of their first conversations, they both basically said, oh, well, things are terrible. They can't possibly get worse. Well, they did get worse. Um, more of the treaties, the Open Skies Treaty, the uh, Conventional Forces in Europe Treaty, uh, more of the last bits of the, um, of the whole disarmament construction between the two countries were abandoned under Trump. Relations got a whole lot worse. Um, so by the time Biden came to power, there was very, very little left. Uh, there was only essentially the, the, the New START Treaty, which was about to expire, and which has been ex extended for five years. But um, no, the, the Trump period was pretty ruinous for uh, US-Russian relations, despite Trump saying all the time, oh, you know, Vladimir Putin is such a great, strong leader. <laughs> There's a paradox there. Mm. It didn't help. I've heard you say in preparing for our conversation and watching some of the other chats that you have given online that you can see the war in Crimea in uh, the Ukraine as being a war between the United States and Russia, but you could also see it and interpret it as a war between the United States and China. I, I found that interesting. Well, to the extent, I mean, if you look around, uh, who is um, benefiting in a way from the, the war in Ukraine? Uh, China politically is certainly not doing badly out of it. And you can see it as China using Russia as a proxy and the United States using Ukraine as, as a proxy. So in that sense, uh, yes, it it it. It has um, aspects of being between China and America. And I don't think anyone would, would deny that the major conflict that you're going to be facing, the major challenge which uh, uh, America faces uh, in its role in the world is coming from China. Um, Russia is, it's kind of, Russia's almost being used by China as an attack dog. The Chinese would never admit that. But um, I think they're pretty, pretty happy with uh, the, the way things are being done. They hope, of course, that, uh, that Putin will at least get uh, sufficient military success to show that uh, America is indeed not able to prevent him doing what he wants in, 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 in neighboring countries um, in Ukraine. But it's not, it, it, it's certainly not against China's interests what is happening. Whenever we do a show on Putin or Russia 
or Ukraine or the dynamics between the United States and Russia, uh, I get angry emails from from both sides, from multiple sides. Um, mm -hmm. Your your approach with this biography on Putin was, was to neither further demonize Putin, but also not to defend him either. I've tried. I think um, if you set out to demonize somebody or you set out to defend them, you are taking a political position. You cannot claim to be an objective scholar trying to figure out uh, what the facts were, you know, what, what this guy did, what he didn't do. You are, um, you're, t you're taking a position. And I don't think that that is what historians or biographers should do. I do believe that readers, if they're presented with the facts or as many of the facts as can be established, are quite capable of making up their own minds. But you're absolutely right. And I'm sure after you're going to get lots of angry, angry um, <laughs> emails after this discussion, people will say, oh, how can he say it's you know, it's not what aboutism. Um, how, how can he uh, say that Putin is not entirely black and so on and so forth? Um, people do have, and it's one of the difficulties of a biography uh, at a time like this about someone as controversial as Putin. Everybody has very strong views. You know, he's not somebody who kind of leaves, le leaves anyone feeling neutral. Oh, Putin, well, oh, I suppose so. we all have our, our ideas and unless in the the way society is is developing not just in the states but in britain and much of europe if you disagree with someone you don't engage with them anymore it's very difficult to have a kind of reasoned conversation it's much more common to for people to trash what they don't agree with and as i say for a biography that that makes it really really difficult well, I appreciate that approach. I, I have recently uh, bought two audio books in the last few months, one on Mao, not yours, but I think I'm going to pick yours up now that I understand your approach to this, one on Mao and one on Stalin, because I just wanted to know more. And the pros, and this isn't to defend either Mao or, or Stalin. I mean, they're obviously responsible for, mm. for millions of deaths, but the pros was so rich with just vindictiveness towards these these people that it made me, it was hard for me to know it just sends this perception of like, okay, this person also may have an axe to grind. And, and it's hard on with controversial figures to find writings yeah. anymore that are just, here's what I found. And you can make up your own mind on that. Well, I'm glad you approve. You approve. It is difficult, but I think it's very rewarding because um, if you laid, you kind of put layers of your own, prejudices, and that's really what we're talking about uh, ac ac across the text, then um, you're, you're not really giving people a chance, even if they want to engage, you're not giving them a chance to do so. Philip Short has been our guest. Again, he has joined us to talk about his book. It's a biography on Vladimir Putin, and it's called Putin. Philip Short, I've enjoyed our conversation very much, and I thank you. Thanks very much, Mitch. Good to be with you.